Our next speaker is um, Leslie Allison. Leslie is a founding member and executive director of the Western Landowners Alliance, uh, also a founding member of the Chama Peak Alliance. Both of these organizations, Leslie's worked extensively with private landowners, multiple stakeholders, and multiple stakeholders to advance conservation, sustain working lands, and support rural communities. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, so um, this talk today is going to be a little bit on the policy front, move a little bit away from uh, the restoration, although I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the journey that I personally went through as a ranch manager uh, trying to restore a forested watershed. Um, so I'll kind of breeze through that fairly quickly. And the thing I'd like to get to really is um, where state and local governments could actually make a difference in accelerating some of the restoration out there. Uh, when you see what landowners kind of have to go through, it, um, it's, it's, it was certainly eye-opening for me. Um, but first, I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about the uh, Western Landowners Alliance. We were founded in uh, 2011. We're Westwide. It's an organization of conservation-minded landowners that represent a very great diversity of land ownership interests and types from uh, forest landowners to livestock producers to recreational ranch conservation. Uh, the common thread, though, is that we all share a deep commitment to good, sound, ethical land stewardship, uh, always looking to improve that stewardship. And we provide a voice for these landowners. We help landowners exchange um, information with one another. I mean, you heard Craig. Craig is uh, one of our board members, one of our founding board members. Um, and Craig mentioned uh, going over to Rancho de Oso Pardo to learn from their experience. That's the kind of knowledge sharing we try to help facilitate uh, out there. And then we try to advocate for policies that help support landowners in that good stewardship and remove some of the barriers. So that's really what this uh, will be about today. Uh, and first, this is what we're not. Okay. We consider ourselves a radical center organization. We're looking for solutions that work uh, for everybody out there and for all the values on these landscapes. Uh, we really believe in this statement here that the desire to achieve sustainable prosperity while conserving our lands, uh, wildlife, natural resources is a common ground, nonpartisan goal. Uh, this is an example of a, a workshop we just did this summer with the Colorado State Land Board and Colorado Forestry landowners, ranchers uh, up in northern Colorado. That's Joe Duda. Many of you probably know Joe out there talking. Um, so this is my, my journey. Um, I arrived on this ranch in 1996. Um, I, uh, it was kind of by chance I got this job. Um, it was a great job to get. Um, I knew exactly nothing about forestry. I came, uh, my, my main job was to fish all the non-native trout out of the river. We had an idea on this ranch that we wanted to restore native trout and it removed, re involved removing the brown trout first. So that was, that was my job. But, uh, but really I knew nothing about forestry. I was an English major in college. I knew nothing about watershed management, not very much about watersheds. Uh, one thing I did know is I didn't like logging and neither did the owners. We were on the same page with that. But I had grown up in a forest uh, inholding in uh, Pecos, New Mexico. And one day, loggers had arrived, a big international firm, and just destroyed, in my eyes, my whole childhood forest, and left behind a whole wake of oil filters and ruts and trash, and uh, left a very bad taste in my mouth. So when I got here, our goal together, uh, me as the manager and the owners, was to really keep this ranch protected and conserved in kind of a wilderness condition. And uh, we didn't think there was going to be much more to it than fishing out all the brown trout out of the stream and locking the gate and letting nature do her work. So how hard could that be? Um, yeah, so the next 16 years, this was me. <laughs> um, So uh, it was kind of started with uh, my very first experience working with uh, you people, foresters, ecologists, was I gathered a group out in the woods and said, OK, we, we, uh, we, money's no object here. We want to restore forest health. What do we need to do? And they said, well, what do you mean by that? I said, well, you know, we want to make the forest healthy. What do we need to do? Is it healthy? Is it not healthy? What, what should we do? And they answered the way I've now come to realize most of you people answer, which is, um, it depends, <laughs> right? Depends on what you want. And they said to me, do you want to grow mushrooms? Do you want to harvest commercial trees? And what's your goal for the ranch? And I said, well, we just want to make it healthy. And it, so it began a conversation that has lasted pretty much my whole career. 
uh, it, def it really changed my thinking about land, and it changed my career in general. Um, what I came to learn as a ranch manager was that it's not enough to want to do the right thing out on the landscape. Uh, I came to identify what I call the three foundations of stewardship. These are things that have to be in place if you want to succeed. So you have to have the knowledge. You have to know what you want to do. And then you have to have the science or the experience to support that. And that's often, all of those are often absent. Uh, you have to have the financial means to do what you'd like to do. And then you have to have supportive public policy to allow you to do it. So a little context on the ranch. This is a heavily forested watershed in southwest Colorado, elevations ranging from about 8,000 to about 12,000 feet. Uh, you can see uh, a lot of aspen component in the landscape as well. Um, so we went all the way from the sort of a warm, dry mix conifer up into the, uh, into the alpine zone, spruce fir. And, it was a horseshoe-shaped valley, which was um, significant because it, was, um, it opened out to the southwest. So our prevailing winds uh, for prescribed fire uh, really were, it was perfect because we were surrounded on the whole top by the South San Juan wilderness. Um, so we had an agency that was receptive to fire. If we had an escape, we didn't have any structures or neighbors that would be threatened up there. Uh, we had a lot of cliffs to protect us. So we had a lot of, sort of room topographically to play in this landscape. Um, uh, there had been some past logging on this landscape, um, varying degrees of, of uh, good and bad for more than a century out there. Um, the last large fires had occurred in that landscape in the late 1800s, I think that 1879 big fire season uh, was there. Um, and we'd also, and I learned this from Craig Allen, so many years ago I went to a talk Craig gave and learned about the period, of, the wet period that we had just come out of there at the end of the 90s, the wettest 30 year period in the Southwest for a very long time. And, and certainly we were in that wet period when I arrived there. So this was our, our first concept of it. Uh, our goal was to restore natural processes. We knew we couldn't thin and treat every acre uh, as we um, went. We wanted to restore fire. We wanted to create a wilderness condition. We wanted to reintroduce native species that belonged there. Um, but as we got an education, um, we began to learn our forest wasn't so pristine. We learned about the fire impacts, the fire suppression impacts. I don't need to enumerate those. You all know what that looked like, but we begin to get our fire hose education. We learned about conifer encroachment of aspen, and we knew that scientists were concerned at that point that aspen were disappearing across the West, and so we began uh, aspen restoration program there in the late 90s. Um, Again, as Craig referred to earlier, we built these brush fences. We experimented with lots of different kinds of fencing. Uh, this worked pretty well for us. Uh, we did these in spots all over the ranch, generally fairly small patches, not much bigger than 40 acres or so. Uh, there had been some poor logging done in the upper watershed, a lot of wind throw. Uh, so we focused a lot on restoring this upper watershed. Uh, we planted a lot of Engelmann spruce up there. One thing people said was, you don't get natural Engelmann regen um, but actually, we got tremendous natural regen up there. These, these that we planted did okay, but then the others did better. Then in uh, early 2000s, we started to get into that fire season uh, that Craig had predicted. And, uh, and here we were surrounded by the uh, Missionary Ridge fire and the Million fire uh, blowing up on all sides of us. Um, and we started to see the spruce, uh, spruce budworm and all the uh, insects and disease that we're, we're seeing today out there. So we've, we fast-tracked our forestry program and we created uh, with a concentration on fuels reduction. And we created what we called our strategic fuels reduction plan. We knew that we couldn't afford and we didn't have the knowledge to go out and treat every stand on the ranch. We didn't want to try going and doing 50 stems per acre kind of things. We, uh, instead, we decided to look for sort of natu the natural mosaic. So we looked at what the overstory was and what the understory was. We saw the big difference that we've seen on earlier slides today. We wanted to restore that uh, earlier mosaic um, so that if a fire did come through, we'd kind of had that natural fuel break and, and effect. Um, so we looked for features like a, a band of cliffs and a belt of aspen, and maybe there'd be a little conifer in between. If we thin that little conifer out, then maybe we'd have a little bit more of a natural fire break. And, and so that was how strategically we thought about our, our forestry. And uh, we began the thinning uh, effort around these places and also um, uh, it began to introduce uh, prescribed fire to restore fire to the valley. This was some of the kind of understory slash and wind throw, uh, pretty heavy fuels that we were trying to deal with. 
Uh, as a private landowner, that, as you'll see, is kind of a big deal. We made a huge investment in this. Um, landowners out of pocket purchased their own brush trucks, their own, uh, all, we had full kits for firefighting and for um, prescribed fire and forestry and invested in all kinds of machinery, training. We contracted crews to help us out when we could find them. Um, these are the two foresters that advised us. I just want to call these two guys out right here on the right. That's Jim Webb um, and Gary Harris, and uh, just two terrific guys, heroes, really, in my book. Took a lot of risks with us. Um, so we were doing a lot of broadcast understory burning, mixed conifer uh, kind of stuff. Really complex valley in terms of vegetative component, um, different fuel types, uh, but this is kind of what it looked like. And uh, remember this picture when we start talking about our local fire marshals. But this is what, as private landowners, we were trying to do. Uh, we are also working with you know, heavy full-size industrial logging equipment. And so our pile sizes were like this. And there was lots of these around the ranch. And uh, we kind of had a motley crew. This is me pregnant uh, out on one of our burns uh, with one of our, our crew, contract crew people. But, um, we were hard pressed to find resources. Uh, those federal crews, about the time um, we were ready to use them for our windows, there was fires breaking out and feds needed them and that was their bread and butter so they were out of there. So it was really always a challenge for us to find crews and we were often very well short, in short capacity in our situation out there. <laughs> I did put him to work on fires, I really did, from the time he was about two. Uh, we had him out there but we had a good time. <laughs> made a fire bug. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but you had this situation where you had a ranch that was just perfectly positioned. It had the right location on the map. It had the willing landowners, had the financial means. We had great consultants. We should have been able to do a much bigger restoration than we did. But instead, we had to fight uphill pretty much the whole way. Um, so back to the foundations of stewardship, you have to have the knowledge. I just want to give you some of the way we were thinking about this stuff as we came into it. it. Might help others. First off, we didn't trust the science, right? Everybody goes, lead with science. Science has to show the way. But we'd seen science change through our whole lifetimes. We're still seeing it change. So when you say that, it's not really helpful. Um, we didn't have a really high level of confidence in human intervention. We, what the story we got when we arrived was, Humans have screwed this up really badly, so now we need more human intervention to fix it. We didn't really trust that very much, so that's a barrier that you have to get through, and it's a big barrier out there. Science changes, and I think we really need to be a lot more humble about science. I think if we approach science by saying it's a process, it's a line of inquiry, it, we add knowledge incrementally, it changes in time, that's cool, but when you try to say that science has the answers, that everything we have that we do should be guided by science, you begin to create some of that mistrust when that science changes. Especially if you have a private landowner that's financing stuff out of pocket because he thinks the science is going this way and all of a sudden, oh, no, we, we think differently today now about Aspen. So um, the science is not always there to support the management. I can't underscore that enough. That just We don't know uh, how to do certain things out there. Uh, science is very difficult to access. As a ranch manager, I would sit on my computer, I would try, to chase down the latest science, uh, mixed conifer, aspen management, a lot of times is locked behind that fee wall, uh, which is frustrating because you don't know if you should pay for it because you don't know if it's going to give you what you need. Um, but it was, it's a challenge that we need to deal with. Uh, monitoring. So we bought into monitoring is important. Do monitoring. It's expensive, so, but we did it. But one guy would do monitoring, and then five years later, it would be a different guy, and he'd go, oh, well, that kind of monitoring isn't really useful. We're going to do this monitoring. And so then it didn't have any continuity, right? And that created a problem. And then when we, even if we had continuity, didn't really affect our management because our decision wasn't made on what that transect showed us or what that inventory showed us. It was made on, are there loggers? What time of year is it? What do we have a market for? Like all the other things were there. So this question about monitoring always sort of uh, hung in the background how to do it and how to use it. Um, and then very little opportunity to share knowledge laterally with other landowners. I mean, Craig just gave this fantastic presentation. There's a wealth of knowledge out there in the private land community. But if you don't have a PhD after your name, if you're not, get the time to go to conferences like this, uh, that, there's not really a chance to share that knowledge back out to the agencies, back out 
to the academic community. That's one of the things Western landowners is actually dedicated to doing is, is facilitating that, that change, exchange of knowledge. Money, another foundation of stewardship, right? So uh, here's a log uh, pile that we put together um, and uh, the market shifted on us and so uh, loggers and the diesel prices went up around that time so th that we couldn't get the gatewood that would even justify sending this stuff off to the mill. Um, so the money is just a, a really big deal. Uh, we actually invested in a, in a mill to try to be able to move the material. Um, we were again fortunate to be able to try to do that. Also didn't work out. The economics for that mill just uh, weren't strong enough um, in general. So um, I'm going to run you through the horrible text on PowerPoint presentation piece, uh, but it's kind of the fastest way to get through some of this right now. We know it's expensive. It's really expensive when you're paying it out of your own pocket. Uh, we need those economic drivers out there uh, to support this. We need liability and um, uh, protection and insurance for prescribed fire. It, it's kind of spotty right now. There was a firm offering uh, fire insurance out of Oklahoma that stopped offering it. It'd be great if we could get a little bit more of that available and deal with the liability risks to landowners. Um, we have very limited personnel resources and uh, very few training opportunities. Forest Guild and some others, na the Nature Conservancy, are really out there trying to fix this, which is fantastic, our, our burn associations, but we need a lot more of this sort of thing. Uh, NWCG standards, just you can't train your own ranch staff. You can't send them out on enough federal assignments to get those task books signed off. So we need to sort of figure out some of that. Um, and then property tax policy does not support restoration. This is a big issue for a lot of us. Um, if you're doing a commercial operation and you're making a profit every year, for instance, in Colorado or New Mexico, uh, you can go ahead and get that property tax break that's like the agricultural tax break. But if what you're trying to do is, is thinning, is restoration, where it's out-of-pocket cost, it doesn't count. You have to show that profit. You have to be in the business of a tree farm. Uh, and so uh, we'll, you'll see here, uh, this is a situation that's actually happening right now in Taos, New Mexico, where the assessor's office has said restoration doesn't count. Um, there are no markets for this small stuff up there that, that qualify in the assessor's mind uh, for this to be an agricultural operation. This guy's thinning out his forest here. So they've said you got to raise your uh, tax rate up to the highest rate, which is development rate, um, which makes holding on to land like this impossible. It certainly makes it impossible for you to take money and put it into forest restoration. So we really need things like property tax policies that incentivize and enable landowners to do this kind of stewardship out there. Uh, and then there's this, and you hear the complaint uh, all the time about regulations. I wasn't very sympathetic to it until I was on the other side of this fence, and then I got pretty sympathetic to it. Um, and uh, So here's one. We told you about our piles, right? So this is a, a county land use, or it's a, yeah, it's a county land use code, or it's a fire code uh, right now in the county that I was operating in. So they won't let you build a pile on private land that's bigger than eight feet, right? Um, you, you can't use material that's larger than six inches in diameter. And, uh, and you have to constantly monitor your burn pile, and it has to be out by, by night, right? So that's not going to work, right? And, and, and we all kind of know, well, we're an exception. We're not the usual property owner. But it still means that I have to somehow, first, there's a liability aspect to this. I've got to go negotiate this with somebody. We've got to figure out how to get around this situation. Um, and, uh, and, and during the time that I was there, is anybody out here a fire official? Do we have any fire officials in the audience? Darn, I wish we did because we need the fire guys on our side here. Uh, I had to deal with nine different fire officials while I was the ranch man. I was there 16 years, nine different ones. Most of those were county fire marshals. The sheriff's department would put the newest rookie on the force into the position of fire marshal. They knew nothing about fire. All they knew is that us burning that stuff didn't, wasn't good. Um, and so we had to re-educate, re-educate, re-educate. These folks, we had to go through all kinds of fire bans and prohibitions. Meantime, we had over $100,000 invested in trying to do this restoration project. Um, so we need to address our county land use regulations with the idea that there might be folks like Craig's guys and our guys that are out there trying to do good stuff. Pro restrictions on roads, road construction. You can't build a logging road out there. You can't do this. You can't gravel with your own ranch. You can't. A lot of those codes get in the way. You spend time fighting them, trucking. 
Uh, now there's new restrictions on the, tr the logging trucks can only operate like once a day, not on weekends, certain hours. You can't run an operation in a short season like we have with those kind of constrict constraints in place. Um, and then finally forest practices, our county had a guy, a homeowner, cut down some ponderosa pine trees in front of the highway and it made everybody mad. So the county tried to take over oversight of all forestry with a planner who had no experience in forestry um, and try to say you can't do any click cuts, meaning our aspen patch cuts, for example, or you can't build a brush fence that's like that. So you're always kind of going through those sorts of things. Fire restrictions, including the pile size, numbers of piles, hours of burning, all that, and then uh, fire bans that come just about the time you want to do a prescribed fire, there's a county fire ban, and you got to get over that obstacle. Um, state barriers, uh, statutes are a mess in some cases. Um, we could have been criminally prosecuted uh, for lighting those fires under Colorado law. Uh, it was always a risk we knew we were taking. Um, we don't have good certified burner programs in the west. Uh, in the east, southeast, they have uh, certified burner programs that also provide liability relief for those people who've gone through the program and operate within their scope uh, to implement burns. We need that in the West. Uh, we all know the state smoke permits are restrictive. Um, that certainly is true for us as well. State forestry can assist, in many cases, can assist private landowners in doing prescribed fire. That's a giant technical resource that's just simply got a firewall. We can't talk across that wall, that could be fixed. Pile restrictions, again, at the state level, state statute pile restrictions. Um, and again, state property tax needs to be fixed to support restoration. Uh, federal, I'm just gonna quick go through these. Of course, the air quality that limits our prescribed fire permits. Federal timber management, people don't realize with so much federal timber that what happens with that federal timber determines if there's a mill or not. And if there's not a mill, the private landowner is just stuck. They don't have any options. So the, the federal policies and timber management dictate the markets and the resources that we have available on the private land. Um, there's often little coordination. I know there's a lot of great work going on to try to fix this. All hands, all lands. That stuff is fantastic. We had a zigzag fence every quarter mile up this ridge. It would zigzag between us and the National Forest. When we wanted to run a prescribed fire up the one side, we wanted to work on the, with the Forest Service on the other side so we didn't have to make a fire line that zigged up the mountain. But their priorities just weren't there to, to be able to work with us. So we have a, a line that zigzagged up the mountain. Um, and of course, forest health conditions impact private side. So I want to get to this really quick because I'm going to run short on time. Just a few tips that I picked up out there I wanted to pass on. It's probably my only opportunity in my life to pass them on. But we came to feel that burning in the mixed conifer, especially tending a little towards that moist side, was better in the fall. You start burning that stuff in the spring, April, and May, and you get those pockets uh, that were unburnt in the middle of your burn because it's all mixed. That's what comes back to bite you in June when all your resources have left and it's just you and your three-year-old out there on the ranch. So we decided this was a much better strategy for us. We stopped burning any of the large piles in the spring for the same reason. Found that in the fall when we burn in the mixed conifer with aspen, that the aspen roots uh, got burned real quickly because they're shallow, and those aspen would just start falling over like ghosts. So we would have our crews out there on the control line, um, the perimeter, and boom, these just deadly aspens coming over silently everywhere. So just be careful out there burning the aspen, especially I think in the fall, it seemed to be worse. Uh, dry roots after a dry winter, then we had the good burn window. And, uh, and yet it turned out that in, in the dry roots from the previous winter allowed the fire to creep underground for weeks. And then boom, in the middle of the summer, trees are starting to spark up like candles out there. And again, it's uh, me and the two-year-old trying to deal with that. Um, Pre-burn thinning considerations, we had a huge debate on the ranch for years. Should we burn first and then thin? Should we thin first and then burn? I can tell you, we settled on that you got to thin first and then burn, but that was a debate that um, took a long time to resolve. Um, really came to question the risk benefit uh, about small acreage. You're out there knocking yourself sp silly, spending a fortune, putting people's lives at risk, doing all this stuff for five acres, 20 acres, 100 acres. In the big picture, does it matter? It's just a question that, that we were left with. Um, and then uh, I think these things are other fairly self-explanatory. 
And here's some things we solved. Um, unfortunately, they changed when I left, but uh, they're going to try to resolve them again. But the county wanted to put in land use code language that said the county was going to manage the forests. We said, no, no. Let's make a deal. Let's put in there that if the forest is professionally managed under certified program under a recognized entity, the county keeps its hands off. If you've got a landowner out there that's doing stuff just on his own, okay, fine, you guys can step in. And the county agreed with that. That was a solution we put into our land use code that I think was important. Uh, MOUs for professionally managed fire, so we were able to negotiate with the county and the fire district, an MOU that gave us exemptions to a lot of the stuff that you know the average landowners are subject to. That was a really big help for us to be able to move forward with confidence in our investment in this program. Um, and then um, there is a new MOU we just helped develop in New Mexico that allows the BLM to work with private landowners using NRCS funding. Uh, and I can, I'm happy to share that with you later, but that's another cross-boundary solution that we just came out with. Um, so these are kind of the public policy needs that, that we see out there today. And I think a coordinated effort between states and local governments to really look at the barriers that are being inadvertently thrown in the path of landowners and restoration could really go a long way if we focused on that. It's not costly. Um, it's more just coordination. We could do a lot. Um, and then I just want to finish by saying this. I learned a, a, a big thing, two big things. When I started, I thought that every decision had to be based purely on ecology. Should we harvest the stand? Should we do this? Should it be purely ecologically based? But I came to learn that if we didn't keep our loggers in business and our mills running and our foresters out there, that we wouldn't have those tools available to us. And so we ended up having to make decisions that we might not have done that particular sale that way, um, but we needed to to keep this whole thing going. And that's important. We have to look at the whole system. I also realized that we don't live in a world anymore that we're going to go back to some purely natural condition. We're in a managed world today. And so we have to get better at our management and our resources and keep those going in the appropriate ways uh, going forward. That was a big lesson for me. And that is kind of part of the landscape out there I wanted to finish with. Thank you. So, so we have about, um, oh, I'm sorry, how many members in the Western Landowners uh, Alliance and what's the geographic range? So we have roughly 200 or so paid members. We have about 1,000 subscribers, and our range is across the whole Western U.S., sort of Colorado to California kind of a thing. We represent about 14 million acres of deeded and managed, uh, or at least land under management in that membership. Thank you. Now we'll take a break.